Hi there, I'm Barbara Sweeney and I'm in the kitchen garden at Vaucluse House today uh, with Doug Purdy from the Urban Beehive and we're going to be talking about beehives and honey. Doug uh, places hives in the urban environment, uh, in big gardens like this, in small gardens, on rooftops. Anywhere we gardens, can, Barbara. Anywhere you can. I know. I know you do. And I'm, I'm sure you're full of stories, actually, about the crazy places you put hives. And there's such an increased interest in um, people keeping hives in their garden. So I thought today we'd look at, you know, what does it take to be a backyard beekeeper? And then obviously one of the motivations of having a beehive is the honey. And we'll move on and taste some honeys. So, um, Doug, you know, you say anywhere, but I think it's really um, a fantastic achievement to have hives in this garden. And you also keep hives at the Botanic, the Royal Botanic Garden and Centennial Park. That's right. And so here are our hives, here are your hives in this beautiful garden. How often would you come down and visit them? Oh look, we come down maybe every three weeks in the warmer part of the year. You know, beekeeping is very seasonal so you don't do much during winter but once it starts to warm up you're coming and checking the bees fairly regularly. So yeah, every three weeks or so. Okay, so here we are in spring, the beginning yep. of the bees' busy time oh, the, of... It's the, it's the beginning of everything, spring, when it comes spring to beekeeping. Spring is the beginning of everything. So when you come into the garden and you look into the hives, what are you looking for? What do you see first? Well, you know, in spring we're making sure the bees have got enough space to store honey and making sure they've got enough honey left over from winter so they don't starve. Because in spring, when you think about things flowering, not everything's flowering at the beginning but at the beginning is when bees are building up their numbers. So basically we're making sure that they're doing okay and they've got enough food, because honey's their food, right? Yeah. And then the other thing that happens in spring, which is a really important thing, is swarming. And so people talk about swarming when they say, oh, the bees are swarming. But swarming is actually a particular event where the beehive decides to try and make a new queen. Is um, it going to do that at the beginning of spring? Oh, well, you know, somewhere between, yeah, I wish we could tell exactly, right. but somewhere between the beginning of spring and sort of November in Sydney. Um, and so what they do is they, they make a new queen and the old queen takes off with half the bees. And, and the idea is to try and um, spread the genetics for the beehive somewhere else. And so that's when you see a big clump of bees hanging off a bush somewhere. That's a bee swarm. And as a beekeeper, if we see those, we like to kind of try and collect them. So I guess it's important for people to think about that and don't call a pest controller, call a beekeeper yeah, yeah. and they'll come and take the swarm yeah. away. I mean, it's, you know, genetic diversity we're talking about. We're also talking about a natural behaviour pattern yeah. that, that we've kind of reconstructed into a, a bad thing or a, or a negative thing that's happening in the hive. When in actual fact, what you're saying is that it's a perfectly natural thing for the bees to be doing. Yes. But before, I feel like we've kind of, ju I've jumped ahead a little bit because what I wanted to ask you was these hives have got heaps of room. When you came to site them, what were the things you were looking for to put the bees here and not yeah. say over there? Well, you know, siting beehives can be difficult in an urban environment because you're trying to find um, somewhere where they're not going to be in the way that's going of to get what? of people because people are scared of beehives. So yeah. you've got to put them somewhere where they're not going to be in the way. Yeah. Um, but they're also, they're living, right? So they need sun. So they need morning and morning sun in, in summer, morning sun and no hot afternoon sun. And in winter, as much sun as they can get. So finding a corner that's perfect, that covers all of those things is quite hard. But this one is perfect. It's absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? Yep. And what um, way are the hives facing? What direction? People will say they've got to face north or they've got to face a particular direction. What they have to face is away from the prevailing winds. So where we are here, we're at the bottom of a hill and the winds come across yeah, I can feel and go the breeze up. Right? Now. So we've turned the hives there away from those, that wind. Otherwise the wind can rush in the entrance of the hive and chill the bees. So we're not actually seeing the entrance of these hives where no. the bees are coming and going. I'm really interested in too, when you talk about people and their fear of bees, um, is there a way of sighting a hive where the two are not going to intersect? This is the bee highway and this is the people path. Yep. Is there a way of taking that into consideration when you place the hive? Well there is. Number one is put them where no one can see them and no one will complain about them. Um, number two is, you know, if the bee's flight path is coming, well you can see them here, I don't know if we can see them particularly well, but they're flight, they cruise at about two and a half metres. So which, these, is, which is taller than me. Yeah, well taller than me too. So they're coming out of the hive and get to that altitude and they keep flying at about that altitude. So if you've got a site where the bees are going to fly across a path, then you can build structure to stop them from doing that. So you can plant things oh, that's interesting. or a bit of shade cloth or something so they go up 
And once they're up, they'll stay up. Wow. And so you can actually create that flight path is what you're saying. Yeah, you can guide them. Oh yeah, cool. So um, we've come in today. It's a nice spring morning. The wind's just dropped. If we can see that there's um, sun, so yeah. on a day like today, are the bees going to be active? Yeah, totally. I mean, and these bees are active. Um, we can see them going in all different directions. You know, they talk about bees making a bee line. Yeah. And so if you look closely, it's going to be almost impossible to film, but if you look closely at the bees, you can see that they're just going, they've picked a direction and they're going in that direction. And you they're know? going there. That's intention for you. Yeah. And um, are there days when the bees take time off? Do they ever take time they off? They never take time off, really. Um, not even, they don't even sleep at night time. They're always doing something. Wow. Um, but you know, as a beekeeper, I wouldn't open beehives on a really windy day or a really cold day or a rainy day. Because just like if you took the roof off my house on those days, I wouldn't be happy. Bees won't be happy either. Yeah, or pulling the doona off. Or pulling the doona off, yeah, any of those things, yeah. In the yeah. morning, okay. Um, so what are some of the more unusual sites you've gone into with a hive? Well, we've got uh, quite a few bees on building rooftops, which people find fascinating. Um, the thing I think it seems a bit lonely up there <laughs> for the well, hives. You know, the They're quite is... stark. Air conditioning units as your neighbour. Yeah, but the air conditioning units produce water, so there's your water source. Yeah, right. Um, so the thing with, with bees is they don't need to have a garden nearby because of the distance they travel. So, you know, these are European honeybees and they travel, you know, maybe eight, maybe 10 k's if they have to, to find food. So nothing needs to be there. It could just be a barren concrete slab and they will be just as yeah. happy as if it's sitting in a garden. If there's food within that if eight there's kilometers. Food within that. And, th and there is. Like. So these guys could be visiting your Royal Botanic Garden bees? They w very well could. Like we're talking about a 50 square kilometer radius. But they're unlikely to because there's plenty of forage around here, so they're not going to go. They're not going to go any further than they have to. Yeah, yeah, they're a bit right. like humans. Yeah. <laughs> so you just made mention there of this. This is this bee is the European um, honey bee. Yeah. Now, what do we know about the history of that bee coming to Australia? Well, all we know really comes from newspapers, and newspapers of the day were a bit like newspapers of today when you're not really sure whether what they're saying is the real thing or not, or whether it's embellished in some way. So the newspaper reports say that bees first came to New South Wales in 1822, and that Wentworth, the original owner of this property, was the owner of the first beehives. Oh, right. And that story says that um, within the first year, there was seven, from, I think it was seven beehives came in, and from that first number of beehives, there were 70 swarms almost immediately, which sounds very unlikely. Yeah, but they'd been on a ship for four months. <laughs> yeah, well, true. Can you imagine? But they would have been very hungry. Yeah, <laughs> right. No food for them. Um, so, so there was a number of attempts to get bees here, and that was the attempt that succeeded. Yeah. But I have read other things that say, that, that contradict that in some ways, but they all seem to think that Wentworth and 1822 was about the right date. Yeah, I know. I read that newspaper report and it said, I mean, it was in the very flourished language of the time. Yeah. And so, and, and that said they appeared to be thriving. And so there was no kind of follow-up report to suggest they were or were not thriving. That's right. But what we're saying is we're dating the European honeybee in Australia or in Sydney from that time. Um, but prior to that, I mean, we have, we have many Australian oh, yeah. native bees, don't we? Yeah, totally. I mean, and we're still finding them today. So the, the, the record, it's supposed to be around 1900 or whatever, but you know, 2000 is a good number to pick because every year they seem to find another one or recategorize an existing one. So yeah, we have stacks of, oh, of native bees. Oh, it's phenomenal, isn't yeah. it? Phenomenal. And so what's the difference between the Australian native bee and the European honey bee? Well, there is many and few, depending on the bee, right? Because we've got, let's say, 2,000 bees. Most of those bees are solitary bees, so they don't live in beehives, they live alone in habitat. Oh. Um, and that's, we'll get back, to get back to the habitat, because it's worth talking about that. Um, very few of them are actually bees that live in a beehive or in a sort of social organisation. Um, so most of our bees, they don't produce honey. Well, they do, but it's like a drop. Yeah, obviously, I've heard sugar bag honey. Yeah, so that's the social ones. Right. So I think there's only four um, varieties of social bees. Four or two, I forget, and something like that. They're not honey producers in the prolific way that these bees produce honey. No. Or in the wild, are these bees going to produce the same amount of honey that they're producing once we've got them into a hive? Yeah, they are. Um, so it's a numbers game. So the social native bees are tiny, first of all, and there's only a couple of thousand of them in a, in a, in a beehive. Yeah, right. Uh, whereas here you're talking about 80, 90,000 bees. So you've got a lot more numbers. Yeah. Um, and these girls make a lot of honey and they don't know to stop. 
So yeah. in the wild, they'd be hanging off a tree or in a, you know, a cliff face or something, and, um, and they, they would just keep growing. Whereas here, they can't. So um, they're limit, more limited in a beehive than they would be if they were living naturally, but they're less exposed. Yeah. So well, there's some sort of, you know, ev they, something evens out the amount of honey they can produce. Can I pick your, um, pick your knowledge here? There's a hive in a hollow of the tree outside my home. Yep. And it's been there for a number of years. And I keep looking at it and it's very active and there seem to be quite a lot of bees in there. Do the bees self-moderate the numbers to manage to live in that space? What's going to happen? Are they going no. to get to a point where they're just going to disappear one day because there's not enough space? Yeah, it's funny. They don't know to stop. So it yeah, depends. Right. Um, I've seen possum boxes where bees have decided to make their home inside a possum box. So we're talking about a box that's, you know, about, about so big. And um, it's not big enough. And so they just keep building comb and the comb erupts outside out of, the box. Yeah, erupts out of the box and yeah, the whole wow. box becomes covered by, by comb and they're inside that living, living in this, this space. You wouldn't know there was a possum box in there until you start cutting the comb away. Yeah, right. So um, with a tree, what will happen is they'll just produce lots of swarms. Um, but they may store so much honey that they've got no room left to make baby bees, in which mm. case they, the, the hive will probably just die out. And that, um, that really, that story about the possum box and the comb just building over, like the idea, I, I just jumped in, you know, the, the visual idea of this kind of hive just being built over by comb, that's where it introduces the work of the beekeeper. Because what you're really doing is working with nature, managing their actions through the year, aren't you? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, nobody, if you're a beekeeper and you didn't take honey out of these beehives, which is a question we get quite a lot, um, the bees wouldn't know to stop. So they'd just keep making honey until the beehive became so low on population because there was no room to lay baby bees yeah. that the hive would be under threat. So you have to take honey off them and, and the beekeeper's job is to regulate um, or to remove enough honey so they've got space to make more, but not so much that there's no food left. So, so, which, so when you hear pe people feeding bees sugar, it's because the beekeeper has been greedy and taken all their yeah. honey away. And I don't think we're talking backyard beekeepers in that sense. So just going back to our, we've sited our bee, we've found yeah. a space in our home, yep. we've put in a beehive. What kind of work will that hive expect from me as the owner of that hive, say in a typical year cycle? Well, again, it's only the warm part of the year. So we're talking, you know, sort of uh, spring to, to autumn. Winter, you don't really do anything. And, um, and about every three weeks, you have to go and have a look and make sure they've got enough space to store honey and give them space if they need it or reduce the space if there's too much. And then four times a year, you need to do a pest inspection. That's a, a legal requirement now where you're looking for certain notifiable diseases to make sure the hive is remaining healthy and not going to make other hives around it ill because it's caught a disease. Yeah, yeah, well that's... And then the magic at the end of it, the, the incentive is going to be this honey that I can say comes from my backyard. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's the best thing. No one ever forgets their first honey harvest. Um, A, because there is honey everywhere and everywhere, and I mean everywhere, you get it in your sock drawer at home but B, because it's such a magic thing, right? You know, it's magic, it's magic that you're harvesting this, this bounty from the bees. Yeah, it is magic. Know? And where did it come from? Where have they flown to make this honey? Where did the nectar come from? You know, it's all these amazing questions. And that's what makes backyard honey so interesting because yeah. it's so varied. Okay, let's go and taste some honey. Sounds great, let's do it. Oh, this is the good bit, isn't it, oh, um, totally. Doug? Because Every hive's going to produce a completely different honey, and every season the honey's going to be different, isn't it? Well, totally. I mean, look at these. Look at the colour difference, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just amazing how, how honeys are so different. I, um, I'm fascinated. I've always had a personal preference for dark honeys, um, and I've always had a preference for Australian eucalypt honeys, and it's really fantastic to see some smaller commercial beekeepers now selling honey by type. Yes. Like this is a yellow box um, honey because the eucalypt tree is just, uh, we have rare honey here, you know. Yeah. We have rare, world-class, amazing Australian honey and we don't tell the world about it and we don't charge what it should be charged. If you went to Tupelo and bought Tupelo honey or French lavender honey or, you know, particular Russian yeah. honeys, they command an incredible price and yet we're still... Uh, pretty much. I mean, a lot of the commercial beekeepers are still blending eucalypt honey and missing out on all that incredible 
um, flavour and un the unique characters of that particular flowering. So this is a yellow box, Australian yellow box, um, but when you taste it you might taste something else in there I'd be interested to see. Well see this one's going to challenge you because this comes from New York. I adore the colour. So Look there are it. no... That's your tip, that's your golden honey. So yeah, there Isn't are no eucalypts in that one. Ah, and what are you telling me, that it's really strongly flavoured honey? It's very different because it's got no eucalypts. So we're so used to the eucalypt flavour in our yeah, honeys right. here. And that doesn't have it. So oh, it's... that'll be interesting. The, um, the thing about a lot of backyard hives is you're going to produce a multi-floral honey, like an urban yes. environment is going to be different to, this is a central western, this is a central west New South Wales honey. And I know that that hive is on a stand of eucalypt trees for a period of time to harvest that. Um, but our bees here, they're going to be nibbling at nasturtiums, every flower in that's the garden, right. every vegetable yep. flower. So that's going to affect the taste of the honey, isn't it? Well, the thing that makes it so much more complex. So I, I equate it to wine. You know, you can have wine out of a cardboard box. Yeah, yeah. Or you can have wine out of a bottle and the wine out of a bottle can be so much more complex than the other wines with all these layers of flavour. And that's what you get in the urban environment. There's so many different flowers. So there's all these layers of flavour from all the flowers and it makes it a much more interesting honey, in my opinion, compared yeah, to a straight I'm with you. I'm with flower. you. And I think what's fascinating, I was just telling you earlier that um, I judge with the um, Royal Easter Show, the National Honey Show. And what I love about that isn't just getting to taste hundreds of honeys a day, yes. Um, but to talk to really experienced beekeepers yeah. who can taste a honey and tell me what floral source it is. Yes. And I want to build up that palette of knowledge because I'm fascinated by honeys. So let's have a look. I know that one of the things we do in competition is we look at the colour and there are sections in the competition for particular different coloured honeys. Now I think there's a preference for lighter coloured honeys. Yeah, there is Most in the show. Most yeah. supermarkets also have yeah. light coloured honeys. But we've got some really dark coloured honeys here. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about your dark honey. Okay, and then I'll tell you about mine. This one's from the North Shore. So it's not an old honey. It's, um, it's a, a newer honey, but it's very, very dark. I don't know what the floral source is. Um, in fact, this is the last jar should that I have. Should we have a taste? Yeah, it totally. looks really delicious. It almost looks like treacle. It does, yeah. So just have, yeah. have a sniff. Okay, I can't smell a lot. I love um, taking more honey than I actually need to okay. taste. Well, if you lie on the table, we can just pour it in if you like. Okay, it's, it's got a real viscosity. It's um, quite thick, yeah. um, which we'll talk about. That is fantastic. That is so delicious. It is like toffee. Yeah. It's like, mmm. And there's a real buttery bit at the end. So we used to sell this um, at the markets. We, we, oh. It wasn't from one of our hives, we bought it from somebody and they had a number of containers of it and we sold it for ages until we ran out. Mm. And everybody comes back and Isn't asks for it. Isn't that sad though? That's, yes. the, that's the downside of particular tasting honey. You're going to run out from that season. Yeah. This one, which is also really dark, is actually a funny story from some friends who have a farm south of Sydney. Um, their dad had some hives on his property and he harvested one year and put the harvest in the in the shed and forgot about it. 40 years later, discovers it. So this is, you know, maybe between 40 and 50 years now, because I've had this jar for quite a long time. And this is really black. Do yeah. you want to have a, do you wanna have yeah. a taste? Oh, no, I'm not going to get it open. Can you have uh -oh. a try? I'll give it a go. I should have run it under hot water. Yeah, doesn't want to be tasted. Yeah. We'll just have to pretend. We'll come back to that. Yeah. So Barbara, you know, while we're tasting some honeys, we really should taste the honey from the gardens Oh here. yeah, terrific. I'd love to do that. So I've got a, a jar here of honey that's come from the beehives here. Yeah. Um, what's amazing about this is you can buy it in the gift shop here. So well, I think what you really put your finger on there is that we're talking about backyard honey and the enjoyment for the beekeeper, but everyone else who's watching is going, where can I get that honey? Yeah. And as you say, this honey is made to sell through the house, for yeah. his house. Yeah, and it comes from the beehives here. So you can actually buy a jar of honey, come yeah. up here and see the beehives. Yeah, yeah. So another thing to talk about with this honey is that it's candied. Yeah, like the one so, I was I was wanting you to talk about that with, with mine yeah. there. And also this one's pretty candied as well. And look, when honey goes harder, it's not gone off. Most yeah. important thing. It's yeah. just perfectly natural. And it's caused by um, the honey inverting. 
let's not go into the technical stuff. But if you warm the jar up again, not too hot, 40 degrees, it'll go back runny again if you prefer runny honey. But some people like it just like this. It's easier to spread. It is much easier but to spread. But you get that granular consistency. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Now, do you want to have a quick sniff? Sorry, I realised yeah. I took the lid off immediately without letting you sniff it. So. You, can, you can still smell it. Yeah. And it has got a little bit of movement because it's moving around in the jar. Um, the colour's beautiful again. And yeah, I can see the granular consistency already. Wow. It's remarkable. It's just so different to everything else we've tasted. Yes. That's the amazing thing about honey. And the next harvest will be different again, of course. Mm. That's um, got a, a beautiful ar aromatic quality. And I hate to say it, it has a real floral quality to it. Um, you don't taste a eucalypt honey and think floral. No. I kind of think strong and, you know, more gummy in the gum tree line of flavours than yeah. a delicate cottage garden flower. Yes. There's a lovely floral quality to that. So, you know, the thing with honeys like this is that each one's going to be different. And that's the amazing thing about backyard honey is that yeah. they're all different. Yeah. And, um, and you know, to come to a place and buy a honey that's yeah. not processed, and, and that's the key, right? And from its point, like just that, that whole, this is of this earth. This yes. is of this, this how, do, how many square kilometres did you say? Well, maybe 50, but it's going to be yeah. less than that, right? So, Here. Yeah. 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 And so it, it truly is Vaucluse House honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's certainly worth spreading on my toast. So what else have you got? Um, There's another dark one there I can well, see. Well, yeah, so this one's actually from uh, Woolloomooloo. Yeah. So this is from some of our hives. Um, and yeah, and where are they located? Uh, they're located right in the harbour part of Woolloomooloo down near the Finger Wharf. Wow. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? On a rooftop? Yeah. On a rooftop, wow. yeah. And so what I, what I figure from those is that it's probably Banksia, because Banksia produces a darker honey. Right. And there's a lot of Banksia down there. there but, is. I, but I honestly don't know. So the interesting thing about urban honey flows is that you know, at the moment, there's not a lot of honey flowing here. It's just starting. But if you're in uh, Maroubra or Matraville, the honey is falling out of the sky at the moment. So different things are flowering in there's different sequences across open, the city. There's quite a bit of open area down there too, isn't there? Well, I think it's again Golf down courses. there. It's the, it's the, um, the, uh, the banks here that's flowering at the moment down there, the yeah, coastal right. banks here. So it's um, interesting. Well, let's see if you can get the lid of that one open. Oh, that's easier. Uh, that that dark honey, the taste is really staying with me. So the other thing with honeys is that some okay. of them have got... This is much... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry go for, So that it's going to say when you open the, the lid, some Aroma. of them have got a lot of VOCs, like you can really smell it, and some of them you can't, right? So This is unbelievable, the difference between those two jars. Yeah. So we've got a much we're more amber coloured. can definitely much stronger aroma. Um, that's delicious. And see, the other thing that we do, so if we're going to show this honey, this wouldn't win anything because it's quite cloudy. Because we don't filter our honey very much. So you can see the lid there yep, yep. has got pollen in it and still. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so that's important because that adds flavour and it's the, the bees have stored that pollen with the honey. So. And also, but, um, I understand nutritional benefit as well. Yeah. Um, it's really hard when you're tasting things to go beyond delicious and gorgeous <laughs> and fine because, you know, essentially what we're talking about here is something that's very sweet on the palate. Yes. So, you know, it's not sugar. It's not empty. Uh, it's, it's not an empty flavour like sugar. It's definitely enriched. It's rich on the tongue and it has that buttery texture. Um, but it has to be tasted to be believed, I, I, I think. Well, some of the, and some of the flavours of these hang around for a long time. So we've got another one that we, we, we call special, okay? And it's, um, it's a honey that we get from different parts of the city, uh, not, all, not every season. And it it's, um, has a propensity to ferment, but it's got a low water content. Yeah, right. And we don't know what it is, but it has a sort of an almondy flavour to it that hangs around for a long time. What's the location? Well, different locations. So we get it in the, in the botanic gardens, we get it in different places. So we can't tie down what, the, what plant it is that it comes from. Interesting. Yeah. See, it keeps you, keeps you nimble, doesn't it? I wanted you to taste this one. Yep. Because this honey label wasn't about where the honey came from. It's actually two things about this jar that I'd like you to talk about. Um, the first is um, the label lists a whole lot of um, health or medicinal um, positives, I suppose. Yes. And it also says 
two times stronger than Manuka on the label. Right. So there's that I wanted to talk about because some yeah. people do buy honey for health benefits. Yeah. But also we've got some candied yep. going on here. So I wanted you to talk to me a little bit about what makes honey candy and um, does that mean there's something wrong with it? Yeah, okay. Well, let me have a taste first. So it's definitely got that grainy texture and candying. Gosh, it's, it's like tasting like, it, it really does taste like Vicks Vapor Rub, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Yeah. You, just, you get that immediate rush of it's it. It's not really yeah. a lot of sweetness. There's a lot of um, oh. that menthol oh, it's quite, quality. Yeah. It's quite. You wouldn't want that on your toast. You'd no, want that for wouldn't. medicine, wouldn't you? Oh, <clears throat> okay. So what is this about? What are the, why are people so keen on this? Um, this isn't a, man, a Manuka honey. It isn't, but, okay. Um, but they're well, it's, saying it's twice as strong. It's certainly twice as strong in flavour. Yeah. We won't be able to taste anything else now. Well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's talk a bit about, about Manuka and the active honey, so what it all means. So, um, so basically, if I get a jar, of, you know, a jar of this honey, and I've got a cut, and I put this honey on my cut, um, this honey produces um, basically bleach, and that will kill... Any germs. Any germs, right? So it is very useful with wound healing. Yeah. Honey, full stop. So it produces peroxide. And, but the body produces an antidote, if you like, to the peroxide. So very quickly, the peroxide activity disappears. I have to have some yellow box to get that. Oh, you definitely, it's, it's strong. I, I feel like I've got a, a like yeah. a lolly in my I've mouth. I've just eaten yeah. Fisherman's Friend or something. Yeah. And so anyway, so that, so that is an antibiotic and that will kill, kill the um, bacteria in my wound. But it stops going very quickly. The other honeys, like the so-called active honeys, um, have non-peroxide activity. So they've got some other form of antibiotic acti activity that will kill bacteria and wounds. It's got nothing to do with peroxide and it's to do with unknown things. Now we know that in Australia um, we have many plants that produce those, those um, act, so-called active honeys, um, many more than New Zealand. We're just not as good at marketing as, as they are. Um, and our industry here isn't as developed, but the whole idea of honey being used as an antibacterial has been around since yeah. Egyptian times. Right? Yeah, yeah. It just, we forgot how to do it because we could take a pill instead. And it's a bit sticky. Well, yeah, but you can, like I'm, I make up a, um, a, a, a ointment at home out of honey and, um, and sorbeline cream. You know? oh, and I won't okay. talk about how to make it because I'm not a doctor, but I use that a lot on rashes and things and it works really, really well. Yeah, right. So that's like, but that, I don't know what tree that comes from, but it's, it's very tree? strong. Do you think tea tree? I don't know. Mm, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's from the Northern um, Rivers District. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do worry about making, people making claims on their labels because I think you have to be very careful about what you claim your product can do. So two times stronger and so forth, two times stronger than what is the question. It definitely question, is a know? marketing, it's a marketing um, yeah. initiative. Yeah. It's a marketing strategy. Yes. Um, I need to, we need to um, go that to one? New York. Okay. But once again, yep. I'm having trouble with this uh, lid. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. Come on. Here we go. No. Excellent. We got it. So you have a sniff first. I won't take the lid off just to hold the... Um... So what, what happens in a jar is the aroma will quickly dissipate once you've opened the lid. So for me to get the full sense of the smell, we keep the lid on to like... Oh yeah, it's delicious. Mmm. Why hasn't honey become part of the perfume industry? I'd, I'd follow <laughs> well, anyone that sticky. smelt you get as things stuck lovely as this. Um, I love the colour. It's you just, as I said before, it just is what you imagine Pooh Bear really yeah. getting excited about. It's much thinner than the honeys we've tasted to date. It's gentle, but it isn't just one tone. Hmm. It goes in and it's like a little graph of a little bit of flavour and then a little hump of flavour and then it evens out beautifully. And it finishes again with a nice buttery, but there's a, a lime edge to the butter. And we don't know any, and it's a raw honey. Yes, yeah, so I know the beekeeper. Zip code local honey. Yeah, I know the beekeeper. I actually met him in the Botanic Gardens one day and he was over here. And he said, do you know if there's any beehives in the gardens? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes. I know where they, just where they are. You better come and have a look. And so he, um, he sent me a jar of honey. Isn't that great? Such an amazing community, isn't it? Yes. The beekeeper community and the people you get to meet and the range of fashion items that beekeepers <laughs> tend to enjoy, such as your Bee World t-shirt. It's I've, a honeymoon, Barbara. Oh, it's a honeymoon. I yes. see, I didn't get that. And you know, little um, cufflinks and ties. Yes. And, Caps and, and yeah, socks. 
Yeah, look, I mean, there's a, it's an amazing myriad of stuff available to wear as a beekeeper now. It never used to be there. Um, <laughs> but, but going overseas, like I, so I went to, um, to Canada last year and, and as part of the, a big beekeeping conference, went over there and visited a whole lot of beekeepers. And seeing all the different beekeepers, there's just as many crazy beekeepers in Canada as there is in Australia. I didn't say crazy. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm a beekeeper, I can say crazy. Well, I think it's a really crazy idea and a fantastic idea to have these hives here in this amazing place because what it's reminding us is what the people who lived here in the past did to create food yeah. and also, you know, the wax for candles and have it be part of the pollination process of the garden. So I've really enjoyed tasting these different honeys today and chatting to you about beehives. Thanks very much for coming along and being part of our bees and honey talk. Thank you, I'm never gonna forget that honey. It's still in my mouth, it's gonna be there all afternoon. I'm gonna gift it to you, Dad. <laughs> Why, thank you.